Uh, we need one more for quorum, right? So, okay. Twenty-seven for quorum. Um, there's a sign-up sheet here for all the bills. So let's see. We'll start with um, Senator Albers on Senate Bill 207. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I bring uh, back before you uh, Senate Bill 207. Uh, just to rewind the clock a bit, uh, last year in 2013, uh, you were uh, kind enough to uh, give this favorable passage. It actually made it out of uh, committee and even rules into the House floor. We just missed it at the end of day 40. Uh, to refresh your memory, and there is a little bit of a change here because of uh, another bill that was passed last year. This is going to become even more simplified. Uh, but this bill uh, is uh, in respect to the First Offenders Act, which uh, I, as well as I think most of us, are big fans of. We want Georgians to always have a second chance. Uh, however, under the First Offenders Act, uh, there are a few areas that we make note of. Specifically, you'll see on line 16 of this bill, which is uh, assisted living community, personal care, homes, things of that nature. So if someone did commit a crime and they did it with our most vulnerable, which are typically our elderly, those disabled, that if they tried to apply in that same place again, that they'd be flagged. It doesn't mean that we don't want them to work at a McDonald's or a Home Depot and other areas, because we want them to be productive members of society. We just don't want to put them back in that same place. Uh, and it's important we have broad support for this, including those who own uh, private home care providers, because they want to be sure that they don't hire folks uh, who've had problems. And that's actually been the case uh, in the past, where they have hired people only to find out that they have either stolen uh, or abused folks in the past. Uh, to simplify this bill, though, uh, thank you to uh, Jill and Legislative Council. Because House Bill 78 did pass and become law last year, uh, we can actually strike lines 19 down. And this will become a very simple one-page bill, and really only uh, the first section of uh, Section 1-1 will remain. And then there will be uh, a retitling, because we do not have to reference House Bill 78 either. Uh, so we'll simply keep lines 1 and 2. Uh, and then the last nine words, uh, starting at to provide related matters on line seven, cutting everything else, and of course, repealing convicting laws and for other purposes. So it's a simple retitle and striking all the other parts because we actually already had fixed that. Uh, thank you to uh, Chairman Willard uh, and his bill, House Bill 78, last year. I'd love to entertain any questions. Can you go over that change again? So you strike from line 19 down? 19 down. All the way to where? Uh, actually, you can... Uh, to, to 75. And then renumber? And renumber, yes. And then in the um, introduction, uh, we're going to keep lines one, one and two, and then we will strike lines three down to mid line seven, and we will start at, after General Assembly, we'll start at to provide for awaited matters, strike the next bunch of words to the next line and then keep to repeal conflicting laws and for other purposes, which is the end of line eight and the beginning of line nine. Okay. Did you get that, Joe? Do you need to make a motion to do this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Then let's, um, does any of the members have any comments about that change that the author is asking? No. Okay. Any questions for Senator Albers? Okay. Chairman Golick. No. No. Darshan Kendrick. <laughs> Representative Kendrick. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, because we're striking the rest of this language, does it still keep uh, private home care providers under a sort of strict liability, where if they're just um, if they have been charged and are prosecuted? then they would still be dis discharged or allowed to be discharged? Uh, I'm sorry, say that again. I'm, I'm if we're striking the rest of the language, correct. does it still have a sort of strict liability where these people can be um, discharged from their employment um, just because they've been charged and are now being prosecuted for doing something in the home care provider, doing something wrong? Well, yeah, so everything that was below that was strictly written because of House Bill 78, so we didn't have a conflicting law if they happened to both pass at the same time. All this will do in Section 1 is um, if they are convicted uh, and okay. they do fall under first offenders, 
then they'll be flagged if they try and go into that same narrow field. Okay. Again, we still want them to, to, to work in a normal uh, employment agency, just not one where they cause harm. Okay. Any other questions? All right, we have some speakers signed up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Vicki Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate this opportunity to testify. The, I'm Vicki Johnson, and I'm legislative chair of the Georgia Council on Aging. The Georgia Council on Aging wishes to testify in support of the House Committee substitute to SB 207. The Council was created by the Georgia General Assembly in 1977 and acts as the advisory body on aging issues to the Governor, the Legislature, and the Department of State Government. Departments, I'm sorry. At its Council meeting on January 8, 2014, the Georgia Council on Aging members voted to support this bill because it helps protect at-risk seniors who receive private home care. Under its provisions, private home care providers can be added to the list of other long-term care facilities, which include skilled nursing homes, intermediate care homes, assisted living communities, and personal care homes in protecting the elderly and disabled adults against exonerated first-time offenders of the crimes of sexual battery, incest, pimping, pandering, or crimes against the elderly and disabled adults as specified by HB 78 passed by the General Assembly in 2013. The Council and COAGE, the Coalition of Advocates for Georgia's Elderly, support the concept of aging in place where elderly adults can remain in their homes and communities with support from services that assist them in daily living. This is what consumers prefer, and it also avoids the alternative of costly nursing home residential care. Private home care providers play an important role in making this possible, and we believe that this bill will enhance the ability of these providers to safely assist elderly and disabled adults. We thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions for the witness? No. Called uh, Miss Melanie McNeil. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Melanie McNeil. I'm the state long-term care ombudsman. And since this statute um, changes our uh, legislation, I just wanted to tell you that we're supportive of this change. What we know is often older adults and individuals with disabilities are very vulnerable and they're targeted, and so we want to be sure that folks who have gotten first offender status but have um, participated in, in um, bad things against vulnerable adults, that they be uh, kept from getting back into that situation where they can take advantage of vulnerable adults. And particularly in a private home care setting, people are even more vulnerable, even fewer people see them, and so there's even less protection in some ways. So we ask your favorable consideration. Thank you. <coughs> Any questions? No, thank you. Anyone else here that wants to speak in favor of or in opposition of the bill? Seeing none. What's the pleasure of the committee? Any Second. Second. A motion by um, Representative Coomer. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Is an amendment? Any discussion? Not. Okay. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. aye. Yes. I uh, want to allow. Yes. Allow now. Not really. Okay. About this one. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't want to say this is on purpose or not. <laughs> all for a, how about this one? Okay. Why don't you come here? And <laughs> also I just want to make sure I apologize to the vice chair, to the committee, and to the audience. I was uh, in a meeting where the speaker was um, speaking, and so therefore I stayed where I was until the speaker stopped speaking. Um, was there a concern expressed by Representative Coomer that what, what is the net effect of, of the gentleman's amendment? It was requested by the author based on the passage of House Bill 78. Oh, okay. The rest of the language was unnecessary. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any, thank you. Any other discussion on the bill? Or the amendment? All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Now, I think the procedure posture is um, there's a motion for due pass um, as amended. LC 295688, right? Wait, no, by, committee by committee substitute, right. Do I hear a second? Second. second. All in those favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. Thank you. Representative Josh Clark will be carrying this in the House. Okay. In that case, the House. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I waited. <laughs> Thank you again to the vice chair. Mr. Broderick, you ready to roll? Okay. In the interest of time, Mr. Broderick, this is the annual, well, I guess what we conventionally call the annual update. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I bring to you today House Bill 835, and we'll be working from LC 33-5367. This is the annual drug update, which is part of uh, the statute in 1613-25. Um, various sections, I'll go over those very briefly. Section 1, scheduling all these compounds as Schedule 1. These are um, deemed drugs of abuse that have no medical, uh, no medical use, so they're Schedule 1. And then um, Section 2 is one other compound that uh, we are putting in Schedule 1 again. It's a uh, non-medical stimulant of central nervous system activity. Um, the section three would be a number of compounds that are identified entirely as uh, synthetic marijuana or syn synthetic cannabinoids uh, since um, our last update from last year. And then we go on to four, five, and six, which are medically um, approved compounds um, that we uh, will put uh, Section 4 in Schedule 3, Section 5 in Schedule 4, and then the others would be just listed as dangerous drugs, which means they're approved by the FDA since our last session and would be written in, into the statute uh, as such. Thank I'd be you. glad to try to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Is there any, is State Narcotics here? Yes. Do you have any comments to add, sir? Okay. Any questions for the author? Seeing none, I see no one signed up. What's the pleasure of the committee? Move to pass. Moved to pass, Mr. Strickland. Second by the vice chair. Uh, any amendments? Seeing any further discussion, all in favor of gentlemen's motion signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have, and the motion is adopted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to the committee. <coughs> Mr. Restration, is he here? Okay, good. Good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Lindsay. When you've been in this job for a while, you get this sixth sense about a quorum possibly being lost. <laughs> and that uh, that's a very clear sense that I have right now. And so that's why we're moving at the clip that we are. Um, I sense there will be some conversation here, and, and rightly so. We want it. This is an important issue. We need to go ahead and tee up and address directly, Mr. Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And tell us who who you've got. You've got familiar faces, plural. Uh, Representative Jones is a uh, co-sponsor of the bill. She's worked very closely uh, in the uh, in the drafting of the bill and would like to participate. Sure. And I have uh, my my district attorney, Paul Howard, here today. Uh, the bill was originally uh, brought to us as a concern that he raised uh, uh, that he's seen in courtrooms in Fulton County. We've also uh, been in, in discussions with the prosecutorial clinic, and they've also seen this as a similar problem throughout the state. <coughs> I will also say right now that they are in support 
of this bill. As well, welcome the, to you both. As of the Georgia Family Violence Commission, who has also reviewed the bill and believe that this would be an important step forward. Basically, what the bill does right now, let me sort of explain existing law. Uh, up to uh, age 10, uh, the courts have the discretion in Georgia to allow uh, a child who is the victim of sexual or physical abuse to testify remotely rather than face to face with the accuser. Uh, Georgia is one of the few states that sets that that uh, demarcation line at 10. Most states have it uh, up until the age of majority. And what this bill will simply do is give the court uh, the discretion uh, upon motion of, of the prosecutor or uh, of an advocate for the child or upon the court's own motion uh, to review the case and, uh, and applying certain factors that are seen on page two of the bill, uh, lines 32 through 60. Six, uh, looking at uh, those factors, determining whether or not this is a case that's appropriate for the child to be able to testify remotely rather than in person. Uh, in in uh, these sort of cases, uh, the traumatic effect upon the child uh, oftentimes leads, quite frankly, to, the, to a second abuse of the child. Uh, this time by the system, and we don't want the system to be uh, a, a part of the abuse that the child has already received. Uh, the right of cross-examination is still preserved uh, for the accusers uh, through their attorney, uh, and the court will then have to fashion a method for that uh, testimony to be brought in and taken down uh, in compliance with the, the accused's constitutional rights. That's, a, that's sort of the overview of the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Have to take any questions, of course. Uh, let me do way. this, uh, Mr. Lindsay. Let me go ahead and, and get a report from the subcommittee chair, okay. Representative Pack. I think when he gives his report, there may. Oh, I'm sorry. Was Representative Setzler? Oh, I'm, I apologize. And of course, he's not here. So um, let me ask you in the subcommittee, and of course, any member can go ahead and, and chime in as well. And we may hear from the defense bar about this. Were there any confrontation clause issues? Actually, it wasn't. The, the, this bill was brought directly to the full committee. Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry. That's. I apologize. Too many bills. Okay. Um, let me ask Mr. Howard then if he has any comments he'd like to go ahead and share. More than welcome to do so. First of all, I wanted to thank Representative. Let me ask you to hold the mic if you could. Thank, thank you, Re Re Representative Lindsay and Jones, uh, for the sponsorship of the bill, and thank the committee for giving us the opportunity to present uh, what we have called Jason's Law. And, and what this bill attempts to do is to solve a truly serious dilemma for prosecutors all across the country. Uh, in Fulton County, uh, in March of last year, we tried a case involving three defendants who were charged with a number of sexual offenses. Uh, in fact, the case was so serious that the Fulton County judge ended up handing out nine life sentences at the completion of the trial. However, one of the victims in this case was an 11-year-old child. And uh, we were informed by the child's treatment specialist before the trial that if the child was forced to come into court and face his accusers, that it would result in the child being more damaged because of that action. So we were then faced with the choice of not presenting the child, or possibly losing this case, or asking the child to participate, despite the fact the child might be damaged more severely. Uh, we decided to proceed further. Uh, the defendants were convicted. However, uh, the child did suffer some additional damage. So what this bill will do is it will allow us to present that child's testimony remotely. Uh, we would not have to bring that child into court to face his or her accusers, and hopefully it would minim minimize the psychological damage to the child uh, because of the testimony provided in this case. How would the cross-examination, just as a mechanical matter, I mean, I realize that would come and it would be determined by the court. I'm just looking at uh, on page three. Page three. Yeah. On line 77, special conditions necessary to facilitate the cross-examination of, of such child. What? Tell me how that would tell us how that would actually work mechanically. That may be a concern. It may not be, but it's well. The defense attorneys relevant. would get a chance to ask questions, but rather than asking them 
to a child who was present in court, they would ask the child through the remote broadcast. Okay. The jurors would hear the responses, they would see the child react just as they would in court, uh, but it simply allows the child to be in another place and not have to sit in court and face the accusers. And in this particular case, it became a particular problem because the accusers were all blood relatives. And that's one of the conditions that the, the bill sets out, that when the court recognizes those circumstances, that that is one of the conditions that might allow the court to order a satellite testimony. And my, my assumption is, of course, that the issue's been vetted before, of course, for the 10 years or younger for purposes of the confrontation clause and the, right. the two-way, I guess the live remote is what I would call it, right? Right. Um, and so that this legislation doesn't do anything to disturb the precedent that's been set, that's been upheld up to this point. Is that correct? correct. It does not. Okay. Mr. Pack. <coughs> Can you speak to, um, in, in the federal system, um, because of the Crawford decision, I think um, they had a rule before, uh, the evidentiary rule in the federal system, on dealing with cases like this, and then it, it was the constitutional challenge, and the Crawford decision came down with, bunch of other cases related to confrontation. Um, did that alter the, the Georgia case law related to um, this issue? Um, or did you have any litigation subsequent to Crawford uh, dealing with the, um, the closed circuit TV testimony? Right. Well, as I understand your question, as you realize now, the Georgia procedure now is the federal procedure. The Crawford decisions relate to testimony outside or statements given outside of court. This is a live testimony by a victim in court. So it really doesn't involve, as I understand it, what Crawford, uh, the decision, uh, hinges around. Because this is live in court as opposed to a statement given at some other time to some other party. And, and we had to deal with that issue last year in, in a different bill dealing with family violence. Dealing outside. heard in several other states um, so that we know that some states go up to the age of majority some go up to 16 and so any challenges likely would have been vetted there and we found none. Proper time. Mr. Chairman. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, just um, briefly is the, the the factors that are listed uh, throughout pages two and three of the bill are, the, are those factors that, uh, what, what's the source for those factors? Well, what we did is uh, Georgia is one of only three states does not, that, that doesn't extend the age up to 18. So what we did is to look at all of the other state statutes and we selected factors that they had placed and they've been using for years and we included those in our bill. Sometimes it's, sometimes I hate to say it, sometimes it's better to be behind. We get, to, we get to rely upon what other states have done and, and have been upheld in other courts. Sure. Thank you. I understand that. Um, in, in reading through them, um, it seems to me, uh, having both prosecuted and defended a number of, of uh, child sexual assault cases, that um, you could fit pretty much any child sex abuse case into this statute. I mean, there's not going to be a case that doesn't fit into the factors that we fit here. So is it is it the purpose of the bill to make every uh, every case fit into this exception so that you never have a child under 18 testifying in, in, as a victim in a sexual assault case? No. Uh, we expect that this would be rarely used uh, because most of our children do not suffer serious psychological or emotional distress simply from testifying. This is simply a case where a psychiatrist or psychologist has to say or to certify that if this child testified it would cause this particular damage so it would not be one to open the floodgates but one that would be would be used in a very limited sense okay and um, and since you just used the phrase uh, serious psychological or emotional distress which is what we find in 27 and lines 27 and line 30 um, I wanted to see if we could square that with the use of the phrase uh, or the, the term psychological harm found on line 34 
and psychological harm found on line 65. And what, what's the difference between harm and distress? And should we should we have those words changed to be consistent throughout the bill? Uh, I think they we the way that we wrote it, they would mean essentially the same thing. And uh, so I would not see any problem with substituting the term psychological emotional distress where the word harm is uh, indicated in the bill. Okay. Uh, like I said, if, if, if for consistency's sake, so there would, you know, sort of echo what he said, I, I, I would view it as a serious, rather as a, as a, um, as a, as a favorable amendment if, uh, if, if you do wish to replace a psychological harm uh, to, uh, with uh, serious psychological or emotional distress, if you wish to do that. I would view that as a favorable amendment. Are there any, um, do we have any psycholog psychologists or psychiatrists here to testify today? Well, in fact, uh, we had two that were scheduled. Unfortunately, they had already scheduled child patients, and they couldn't be here today. Uh, but we had planned to bring at least two today to present testimony to the committee. I'm just curious to know if, if distress and harm are, are terms of art in the profession that may have a different meaning to a, a practitioner. And if they if they are different, then we want to make sure we get the right term and not just using one that we think may the sound term, better. The term that it was used when I talked to the, to the psychologist about it, uh, they were comfortable with with serious psychological or emotional distress. Th there is a, I mean, I don't pretend to be a professional in that area, nor does anybody at the table here. My sense of it, just construing in terms of plain meaning, is that distress and harm are two potentially very different things. And that distress would lead to harm. Harm seems more of the de facto result of, of the distress. And so what we actually end up with on a consistent terminology basis, I think there's a distinction to be made, not persuading or dissuading as to which one it should be. But I, I would just note that my sense of it, personally, not seeking to impose it on any member of the committee, is that there's a difference. And I would really like to get some guidance on that, um, just for consistency's sake. and what's in the best interest of the child. Mr. Chairman, if I may, our no. current statute um, uses the term serious emotional distress, so that may be a good guidance to go mm -hmm. by what our Georgia Code has already fleshed out. What, what is that? This is 17855, subsection A2. This is the current statute that we would be amending. Yeah. And uh, subsection uh, specifically uses serious emotional distress such that the child cannot reasonably communicate, so it gives a bit of a definition as well. Do you, I mean, do you so, agree, Mr. Howard? I mean, there's there's a difference there. Yeah. And I, I, just for purposes of so consistency, I'd want to hear from the, some right. of the professionals. Don't to see whether or not it should be, whether it could be the same term or whether or not they should be distinctive terms. Yeah, I mean, there, we, we here, you know, think of it in one way, right. uh, psychological professionals, those may, may be terms of art that go a lot deeper than than we're aware of. But if anybody is aware, we we can provide the, uh, the 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 doctors in that area, the specialists in that area, for the committee. Yeah, so and we're we not looking for any, you know, it, uh, certainly a debate on on the issue. It's just right. that what is the cautious I'm route, and that what's the cautious, consistent route that'll be in the best interest of the child that also won't cause any problems for the court. And again, just to read from the point before Mr. Coomer made, ultimately the discretion is still in the, in the court's hands at all times as to whether or not the remote occurs. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Qu other questions from, mem from members of the committee to the author and his guests? Seeing none, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones, as well. Mr. Howard, I see on the witness list you have a battalion of prosecutors with you. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, since they're lawyers and you only have limited time, I thought I would just speak for them. I just I wanted <laughs> uh, uh, we're, we're deferring to you on that. <laughs> Those like are your to, troops. So. I would like to mention, because with uh, Representative Lindsay, the bill was presented by a group of interns in oh. our office oh. and uh, from the University of Georgia and a number of other schools. And one of the interns is here today, and I at least wanted to recognize him as he's still sitting here. There he is. A third year law student at the University of Georgia. And uh, so at least we wanted to acknowledge him. What's your name, sir? Michael Smiley. 
Michael Snow. Oh, okay. We've got another one of the interns. Who and what's your name, sir? Mr. Ingram. Thank you very much for both of your, your, your work here. This is the real deal right here. You're having an impact. You're not even sworn in yet. <laughs> and you're having an impact, so congratulations. You've gone a lot further than, than a lot of people have. Thank you to, to both of you, sincerely. Uh, we have some other folks um, signed up. Ms. Michaels, did you want to? I see you here yes. for 804. Yes, thank Please. you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Sandra Michaels for the Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. Um, I took the liberty of making a copy of Section 17855 for each member. Um, should I just pass around? Sure. Um, the proposed bill, and I'm completely sympathetic to. But this is a copy of the current statute. And the reason why I made a copy for each of the members because you can see <coughs> that House Bill 804 greatly expands and changes this section. Um, and there's, there's two major changes. And what I was saying at the beginning was, while I'm extremely um, sympathetic to the situation, Mr. Howard, who's also my uh, district attorney, I'm a Fulton County member. Is there an extra copy by any chance? Um, thank you. Um, the first thing is you will note that um, 17855, testimony of, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, for children for 10 years or younger, it was very specifically um, done for the problem where there's a child who's having issues. This is where the child is a, is a victim. You'll note on House Bill 804, um, a major change in our, our current statute on line 16, which changes it not to only just a victim, but also a witness, and then list a number of the crimes in which um, this statute would apply to as both a witness or a victim. And it's not just uh, murder or kidnapping or rape, but it's also um, in the 16, all the sexual offenses. So we're, we're concerned that you're expanding this from a victim to a witness. Um, one of the clarifications I'd like to make, um, S Supreme Court, um, J Chief Justice Scalia, who is no liberal slouch, um, makes it clear that it's not a right to cross-examine a witness, it's the right to confront a witness. And I believe his actual words are, before you sentence a person to prison for the rest of their life, that person should have the right to confront face-to-face -face their accuser. Now, keeping in mind, um, if you are concerned about some of the issues that um, district attorney raised about a child, one way to resolve that his concerns and keep the integrity of 17855, which is, for those of you that were here in 1991, this is very carefully drafted, um, maybe make a testimony of, of a child 18 years or younger and change the 10 to 18, and that way the scenario that District Attorney Howard mentioned would be covered. It was a victim, they were 11 years old, and they had concerns, and then there would have to be a showing before the judge why this particular um, child should testify not in the courtroom. But what was raised um, by the representative on line two, excuse me, pages two and three, a judge um, using a preponderance of the evidence a judge could find a witness or a victim 10 years or on younger and just one of these circumstances, starting on line 32 of page 2, all the way through to line 96, I believe, excuse me, line 66. Any one of those circumstances, if there's a preponderance of the evidence, the judge could allow that child, even if that child's 17 or 18 years old, to testify. Um, outside the courtroom, outside the presence of the defendant. Um, and if you look at line um, three, 36, 3, the judge would just have to find at the time of the alleged offense, the accused was the parent of this child, either the child victim or the child witness. Um, I, I believe this, these exceptions are so huge and so broad that almost any circumstance could be found. Um, this bill was not vetted through a subcommittee. Um, as I think most of the members here know that we work very hard in subcommittee to perfect a bill. Um, I would be very um, happy to work with district attorney 
and a representative Lindsay on maybe making this a little tighter. I think as written, there are some, some issues with it. I think a, a better way to do it, and if you, if you again look at 17855, if the concerns are, um, as Mr. Howard raised, about a young person that's over 10 being subjected to psychological harm or psychological distress. Um, and again, I haven't seen all the other states. I'd be very curious that all the states allowed either a witness or a, a, a victim um, to be under the age of eight, eight, or excuse me, 18 and under, and all those circumstances be allowed. I think this is a very broadening of, of our statute that maybe wasn't quite intended. The other thing I'd also point out, um, if you look on page 2, line 47, I, I'm not sure if that means uh, in 6 where the accused has inflicted serious physical injury upon the child. Is that previously? Is that a subject matter of the current charges the accused is on trial for? Is this what in federal courts called 404B, or a, a, was this something the accused has been accused of doing before? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, I think, in the way the bill is written. And if we really want to make sure that a child, and, and again, using 18 and under, I mean, 18, I'm not sure even in the code section, I mean, juvenile code section, I, I, there's just some conflict there that I think would be best vetted in subcommittee or at least in a study committee to look at a little more closely. And again, we would commit to working with them. I'm not opposing this bill in its entirety. I'm just saying I think it's a little overbroad. Um, and the cleanest fix for me sitting here, and again, I'm not legislative counsel, but would be to change an 17855 on the copy that I made everyone, that the testimony of a child 18 years of age or younger, and then all the precautions are followed that way. If, if somehow they have a witness or a victim and we should explore the witness part because that raises a lot of issues. That's not just the victim of the perpetrator. That's just a witness. So it, it, we'd like to be very careful about that before we open open all that. Um, anyway, I, I would just propose some caution before we move forward with such a, a wide change. And again, I'm not speaking against the bill. I'm speaking to help work on the bill. L let me ask you a question with regard to the victim, not only just the victim plus the witness. Are, is it your contention then that that there are, is there a confrontation clause precedent against expanding it to the witness that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of, aware of, but but there would be, in, in my opinion, and other folks I ran it by, and our, some of our juvenile uh, public defenders were concerned that if if you expand it, all these conditions, before, if you look at the original um, code section, the judge makes the finding of the emotional or psychological distress of the child if they have to go forward and testify. Here, you don't have to have that. You can have any of these circumstances. It's, it's not psychological distress and one of these occur. You can have just one of these, that the child's related to the, to the perpetrator, or they live in the same house. If you go through and look at no, we, under, we understand what the okay. bill says. It's just that, you know, you're, you're, my question is, is there established court precedent guidance on the expansion to the victim, excuse me, expansion witness. to a witness that precludes this from a precedent standpoint? I mean, it's a yes or no. I don't know. Okay. That I'm going to take that as a no. My question, unless someone tells me otherwise, my other question is... It, more along the lines, and I don't know if this is something you would care to answer, but you know, it wouldn't it be true that you know a witness in this situation who was a child, just because I mean, certainly the the victim and what the victim has gone through, you know, speaks for itself. But I don't think we should minimize the potential negative impact that the experience uh, has on a potential child witness in this situation. You seem to you seem to minimize that, and it would seem to me that whether they're a victim or a witness, it can be very traumatic, cause emotional harm or distress, however, whichever term we're going to go with on a consistency basis. It seemed to me that a witness in that situation who was a child could very easily sustain that kind of harm if they're in that situation. You, you disagree? I, I disagree that I was minimizing that. I, I made it clear. Well, you think we should take it out? No, I, I, right? I think what I... Or did I, did I not, not understand that? I think what I'm... Let me let me clarify. Okay. This bill 
raises a bunch of different new issues, witness and victim. It adds witness and victim. Do I know whether for sure the Supreme Court has included witness as a potential problem as a victim in confrontation? No, I don't know the answer to that. And I wouldn't assume the answer is no just because I don't know the answer to that. I just don't know. But I do know that Su Supreme Court Scalia has said that cross-examination is not confrontation. No, I Secondly, understand that. That's why I asked the right, question. And is there to your question, is, am I minimizing the trauma to witness? I, I, Ms. I'm, Michaels, I'm, I asked you a very simple question. I'm simply asking you if you're aware of whether or not the addition of a witness for these types of protections for remote testimony has any, court, any kind of court precedent that per, would preclude us from going forward because it would just be struck down when it was challenged. We have no interest in doing that. If that doesn't exist, then that, if that doesn't exist, then let's take a look at what we're doing potentially with witness. We understand the harm, obviously. We all understand the harm that you know to a victim. Mm -hmm. What I think there may be a disconnect here is my sense is that the advocates for this bill are advocating for the fact that where there is a witness who g witnesses this particular crime, that the emotional harm, however we're going to describe it in the bill, that could happen to that witness too, that child sure. witness. Okay. Sure. And so if, if the answer is sure, then why shouldn't we include them? That's what I'm trying to figure out. Because um, you shouldn't include, you could include it, and okay. I think you'd be protected under the, under the Constitution if you added in the original 17.5, excuse me, 855, if you added the court may order the testimony of a child. 10 years, make that 18 years of age or younger, who may have been the victim or witness, if that's your concern, of any violation. And then it has a very tight way it's, it's resolved. So that would cover your concern, Mr. Chairman, of psychological harm to a victim or a witness, and it would cover um, Mr. Howard's concern that they were outside the 10 years because they had an 11-year-old victim without removing the safeguards that you already have in 17855 and, and not add in, which is a whole lot of exceptions in here. The concerns that he raised would be covered by witness, victim, and age 10 and over. And just to be clear, you, you would agree with the 18 or under, is that correct? I, I'm seeing where that could be a consideration, but it, you would want the judge to make these findings that already exist in 17855. And, and not allow for any any other basis for that kind of finding as per eight House, House Bill 804? Yes, sir, I think that would be okay. a, a better bill. Mr. Peck. <clears throat> Ms. Michaels, isn't it true that, as I understand it, and it's been a while since I took evidence, um, that there's really no constitutional rule requiring face-to-face -face confrontation? I don't, I don't think that's correct. but Because I, I was just kind of looking up Maryland versus Craig, which kind of first dealt with this issue. It's, I mean, I think the majority opinion said it's a preference, and that's why they justify the screen behind the screen testimony, right? I, I can't, I cannot, I have no idea. I okay. can't engage in the constitutional aspect of that, but the right of confrontation is pretty clear. Okay. Um, I, I guess we can look that up. And the question becomes, following up on the chairman's comments, there's really no rational, if there's no restriction like that, there's really no rational basis to, the state interest to protect is to protect the child witness from trauma, right? Do you mean witness or victim or both? Well, witness, whoever testifies okay. a traumatic event. So, um, so if there's no, uh, uh, so stick with me for a second in terms of, I don't think that there is a requirement that you have to have face-to-face -face confrontation every single instance in a criminal case. I don't think you're right on that, I'm sorry. If that's true, and assuming, you know, you, you can put me wrong later, if that's true, then there's no concern about uh, any child witness who testifies against a defendant in a child um, molestation case? I think you, there is a concern that regardless of the age of the witness or victim who's testifying or making these accusations mm -hmm. against an accused, there's always a concern that it be face to face. You have the right to face your not cross-examination, but face-to-face, -face, unless certain conditions are there that would not would cause psychological harm, which is what the current 17855 covers. Okay. 
Mr. Howard's concern, and I, I'm, I'm extremely sympathetic and I understand his position, <coughs> they had a victim who was over the age of 10. So my suggestion is instead of expanding this hugely with a bunch of exceptions, change it to a child 18 years of age or younger who has been the victim or a witness to and the list of violations. Hmm. And then okay. still allow the judge to make the finding that Mr. That Mr. Chairman talked about about an expert finding of psychological harm or distress, whatever word is the appropriate psychological and legal term to use. And, and that way, the con every concern that Mr. Representative Lindsay and Mr. Howard brought up would be addressed without expanding it so greatly that it would be meaningless anymore to have all those different exceptions. Uh, because if you look very carefully at it, they just have to find one of these conditions and they, they can allow to have closed circuit or however they do it, video testimony, which I think would not meet the right of confrontation without a more specific finding. Can I ask one follow-up? Uh, to ask, you, you specifically pointed out lines 36 to 38, and it seems to me as long as we make a public policy finding that there's substantial state interest in adopting this, I think we're okay in constitutionality, right? So in terms of 36 to 38, the way it's drafted, and correct me if I'm wrong, is in a situation where the parent is the abuser, I think it's no-brainer to think that it's gonna be, the kid's going to be very intimidated to testify against their parent face-to-face. -face. Right, right, and to use your word, no-brainer, right. um, if that's the situation, then the state or, as you'll note, even in the original statute, mm -hmm. the, the judge on its own motion can can have an expert say I'm going to find that there's psychological damage and of course it's an accused not a convicted um, that they find that there would be psychological damage if this young person was required to face their accuser but but to make it just automatic which it is here eliminates the no-brainer part of it it would, it would be a much better to still make a finding of psychological emotional distress which the new bill does not have you could just find that the child. Well, that's the, that's a judicial percent. I'm talking about us. We can make a public policy finding now, saying that in situations where a parent is the accused, and a child has to testify against that person, we find that there's compelling state interest to, in fact, let the judge rely on that just one fact alone to trigger the um, the the closed circuit TV. I mean, is that okay? If you're saying that you would automatically that you think is a a no-brainer policy that if the victim is related to the accused who's accused of abusing them, that that should automatically be the right to have a close term. But that's not what the bill said. The bill says person responsible for the custody or care of the child at the relevant time. It's not It's not the relationship so much as the duty of that person, right? right? I, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm saying whether it's blood or, you know, they live in the same house, I, I don't think that is should be an automatic policy okay. that would allow for uh, no confrontation. But it's not automatic. It's the, at the discretion of the judge, correct? There's the no automatic anything. The, well, no. But, but that's what he's asking to have a policy decision. No, the policy decision is whether or not that we should expand the criteria from which this judge can go ahead and make the determination, yes or no, as to whether or not the testimony ought to be made remotely or not. There's no matter of right. It's all in the judge's hands anyway. We're just we're just potentially expanding as a matter of policy, as the vice chairman says, the criteria that the that the judge can use as the basis of his or her decision. If the judge found by preponderance of the evidence right. that the child was in, lived in the custody of the parent, guardian, or legal custody, custodian, that the accused was one of those people, and there's no finding that that would cause psychological damage, I, I think I think that's a problem. I understand what you're saying is that we're, we're talking about two different things. Let me, Mr. No, Ant, I'm sorry, Mr. Pack, did you have? No, I'm just, I, that's, but that's not what the bill says. Yeah. Uh, if you go to uh, paragraph D, um, the court may order a child to testify outside the physical presence of the accused, provided the court finds by preponderance of the evidence that such a child is likely to suffer serious psychological damage, excuse me, or emotional dis distress. So and you go down find, right, in determining to. whether it, but it doesn't say. In determining whether preponderance of the evidence has been shown, the court may find that one of the more of the following circumstances establishes in itself. They don't have to find that there is actual psychological damage. They can find that if these conditions exist, that's enough for psychological damage. 
And I think that's the problem I'm having. I think we're, we have a different interpretation. I think we're saying the same thing. If the judge finds that the child lives in the presence of the accused, that in itself is sufficient psychological damage. That, that's the way this bill reads. Okay. Mr. Peck. I mean, uh, Mr. Ramsey. Well, I, I, the same point, I agree with you. I don't think we should parse out every cer certain circumstance, which is what these, all these examples are. The bill, as the original statute as written, provides for findings of that. And you wouldn't have to limit, I guess there's no need to right. list all these. You're right. You can you can find the public policy. I I'm right, just. We can't, we can't, but, but you agree with me that if one of these tests, we're not requiring the, the court to automatically advocate its, its judicial discretion. And say okay, well they live the, they're, they live in the same household with the child. Automatically that gets you out of the out of the out of the presence yeah. of the court. I think the way it is written does not make it clear that. And I understand what you're saying. I mean it's just. I, I think my suggest I think my suggestion of how to change it to cover the situations that Mr. Howard brought up is, is a much cleaner and way to cover every situation you've just suggested and every situation in here. I think it would just be better. And drastic as a matter of public policy, drastically reduces the fact that you know the underlying bases for when the child can testify remotely, which is what you're advocating because you want to lessen the number of possibilities of the child testifying remotely which is fine you know that's a public policy position that we that we're going to consider but that's what it is i mean by virtue of not going with the language in 804 that by def and reverting back to current law but also adding in the witness it still reduces the number of bases for which the judge can look at for guidance as to whether or not he or she is going to go ahead and approve the testifying remotely. I think we're just I, on yeah, different pages. That is what I said, but as a practical matter, you. I will tell you, well, that's what all of us heard. As a practical matter, we are going to go ahead and take a hard look at the emotional distress, emotional harm issue as a practical matter anyway. So we'll have some ongoing conversations. Were these additional questions for Ms. Michaels? Mr. Sessler. Um, and we're going to have someone look at the microphones, by the way, in the next day or two. Yeah. I, I can understand that circumstances would arise in which the statute is written, 17855, a child would, there would be psychological damage to a 12 year old. I'm not trying to narrow the circumstances. No, I'm, just, I'm just trying to kind of start a little, a little higher level. Okay. I mean, would, would you agree that the, 
that, that um, providing an opportunity to, to, to argue to the judge on a whole wild and wide variety of reasons why a child shouldn't uh, testify, whether they're, whether they're a victim or whether they're a witness, shouldn't have to face the person that's being accused. Wouldn't you agree that having zero guidance and allowing any kind of argument to be brought to bear is not a good idea? What I'm hearing you say is narrowing the set of circumstances and the conditions in which that, that kind of argument can be made at the table. You, you, want, you want to narrow this as much as you can. <laughs> no. No, what I'm saying is if you look at paragraph 2 on 17... I'm, I'm answering your question. Honestly, Robert says that's where I am. Suffering serious emotional distress, the way it is written, because it doesn't... It, I don't think you need all these examples. Okay. Okay. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is that what I'm hearing you say is having zero guides allowing allowing any kind of argument being brought to bear um, is not a good idea. That, that you believe we need to narrow the set of circumstances in which um, this kind of case can be made. That's what you said. You said these are too broad. You said you know, if we can help narrow these down some, it would be better. I think what I'm saying is that the circumstances that Mr. Howard told you that he needs this to be expanded for is not related to the psychological distress because you can show that if the child is psychologically distressed by anything. The, the statute you already have, if you changed it, added the word witness and you changed the age from 10 to 18, would cover every single circumstance if you have someone that shows psychological distress would occur if they had to face Uncle Jack or you know the neighbor. And I'm just saying it's it's well written as it is. So I, I why change it? Other than those two points. Where I was going with this was you were arguing ten minutes ago that the need to narrow the sum let, 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 let it not be the wild west. Let, let the, the number of um, conditions the basis of Happy to think about it. I mean, just off the cuff, I don't want to answer that because I, I haven't thought of it. Uh, Mr. Atwood and then Mr. S Mr. Strickland. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Michaels, for being here. I would direct your attention to line 71 and 72. 
I have some concerns with that verbiage. And help me refresh my memory. It's been a long time since I've been in a court. We had uh, essentially a VTEL uh, testimony. But the normal procedure would be for an accused to sit in a courtroom, correct, look at the TV, and then the child, and normally their defense attorney and the prosecutor would be in another room asking the questions. Is that correct? My understanding is, is the child would be in another room, mm -hmm. and that I've seen it been done both ways, like the prosecution and the defense, I, I can stand corrected, that mm -hmm. it would be the defendant that would be not in the physical That's presence, yeah. but everybody else would be would allowed be in to the, be. in there with them, because I, right. I, I, I because have that, very little problem with a defendant, as long as they could see a TV and see their accused, or s accuser or the witness. My concern on line 71 and 72 is they put together a list and list any individual or category of individuals allowed to be in or required to be excluded from, and such list may include the defense attorney. That concerns me a little bit. Yes, that would be problematic. I have no problem with the defendant being excluded, Mr. Chairman, but I do have a little concerns about that particular verbiage if I'm reading it correctly. That's all I have, sir. Mr. Strickland. Ms. Michaels, looking at the current law of the 1785, unless I'm just reading this, it looks like this law deals with the ability of the child, the child's ability to actually communicate, not so much the most distressed cell experience, but actually their ability to still communicate on the stand. It seems like this bill deals with a whole different area of the law. We're, we're actually looking at the effect on a child, not their ability to communicate in court. So if we went back and just amended 1785, my understanding was that the issues is trying to ra raise and I'm, I'm not talking I'm talking human talking right now yeah. that the problem was that a child the victim slash witness is so distraught over what happened or even like seeing you upsets me so much that I can't get out what happened to me because it, I'm so frightened and that what they're what they're trying to protect is their witness from saying what happened, what they saw, what they observed, what happened to them, and to say it in such a way that's sufficient to get beyond a reasonable doubt that that accused did the job. But in 1785, that's what we're trying to do there. But this, yeah. this, this, this is looking at long-term effects on the child. Isn't this a whole different debate? We're looking at the long-term emotional distress a child may experience after testifying, not their ability to actually communicate in court. Well, that would make the confrontation issue um, even more strong because the issue is the child is trying to, c the communication is what happened to them. I think if you're trying to say that if they testify, just te the testifying themselves is gonna create damage, I think that, that is, that's not good for the a confrontation challenge. You, you want, the confrontation challenge has to, the child has to be able to say what happened to them. If you're saying that we wanna expand it, and not only they're not able because they're so frightened to be a, a witness and say exactly what happened to them or what they observed because the sight of their the person that allegedly did it to them obsessed them so much they're not even able to communicate on the stand as a witness and then you're saying you would like to ex expand that that in the future they could have psychological damage they can talk on it they can say you you uh, sexually molested me representative and b the fact that I have to say that is going to cause me damage in the future that I should not even have to say that to your face. I should say it off camera or out of the thing. Well, that, what I'm, under the Constitution of the United States, I think you have to take in all of these. What I think what I had suggested of the change to 7855 covered the circumstances that you're talking about. And if you say the child cannot reasonably communicate, if you think communicate the facts of the case, or not, if you want to get more technological term, that you're right, that might be a better way to use it, not just use the word to communicate. But the whole point of this was, this is a child that experienced something and that the presence of the accused is such that they're not even able to, to, to speak clearly because they're so traumatized, which is why it's age 10 because the, the, conveying, the wisdom of the time was that an older child would be able to deal with it. 
I agree that there may be some circumstances which that aid should be expanded and that an expert can talk about the psychological harm. But my understanding, talking to people before today about what they were trying to cover, all the circumstances they told me were issues is covered under witness, victim, over the age of 10 and under 18. Not future, future trauma of having to testify. I mean, that's terrible, but, but you still have the confrontational clause of the Constitution you have to deal with. Uh, two takeaways. One for the next meeting. The one is we need to get um, consensus on the proper consistent terminology on distress versus harm. Um, the second thing, Ms. Michaels, is that if there is precedent out there anywhere on uh, confrontation clause issues that would preclude from a practical standpoint our passing this type of language, we need to know about it. Um, pretty simply. So we'll have, obviously we have time, plenty of time. So let's go ahead and use it. If there is such a precedent out there, we need to know it. And then let's go ahead and clean up on the psychological piece. And we'll tee it up at the uh, the next meeting. Sure. I find it fascinating that um, my friend the defense counsel here, and I keep in mind I started my legal career through criminal defense work, uh, believes that by setting out possible factors for a court if we level the water as opposed to help get the court additional guidance. Because we were just raising it from 10 to 18 is why I went and looked at those other states and looked at the factors that they used because I wanted to provide additional guidance that, that might be necessary for a court over the age of, of 10 to 18. Uh, the whole purpose there was to give the court additional guidance. Uh, if you look at the existing uh, statute, it provides absolutely no guidance to the court in terms of uh, how to define uh, psychological damage. Uh, what we were trying to do is give the courts uh, some guidance, not mandate what they would do, but to give them guidance that really had none right now since we were raising the We recognize the fact that, you know, the discretion of the court is maintained within the bill. Um, we do want to, you know, if there is something out there with regard to confrontation, uh, we need to know about it, and that's something for us to keep in mind if it exists. And we'll take a, you know, we'll all take a look at it and see if there's any there, there. So. With that, we'll go ahead and suspend consideration on 804. The tentative plan will be to go ahead and tee it up at the next meeting, which I anticipate to be uh, Monday. We'll be ready. And we'll, uh, we'll roll from there. Mr. Epstration, you've been very patient. Thank you for your patience. Can you please come over to the, um, Thank you. To the hot seat? <laughs> Thank, you, <Mr. laughs> Thank you, Mr. Howard. Thank you very much for being here. We, uh, we have in front of us House Bill 770, Representative Efstration uh, brings to us, and I know he's worked very hard on this. Mr. Efstration, I'm going to ask you to give us a few minutes. We've got a hard stop at 3. We've got time. Yes, sir. Uh, we've got a hard stop at 3. Oh, doesn't mean we have to use all that time, just you know, to be clear. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll ask uh, uh, the Vice Chair, who's the Subcommittee Chair, uh, for his report, and then we'll go on from there. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, bring before the committee today House Bill 770 uh, with a uh, substitute, and we'll be asking for your favorable consideration. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before I begin, Legislative Council uh, has made um, a recommended change that I'm in full agreement with. We're operating under, under the substitute LC 410176S, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could direct the committee's attention to lines 28 and 29 to strike beginning at 4 and ending at the end of the sentence, so uh, there would be a period after withheld. And we'll go ahead and discuss that in, a nature of a, in, in a, uh, the nature of an amendment to the substitute when we go ahead and take a motion. Yes, sir. Okay. Excuse okay. me. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this, this bill uh, creates a new criminal offense of home invasion um, from my experience as a prosecutor, my conversation with judges and attorneys, uh, I've noted that as uh, the law currently stands, burglary first degree or second degree um, 
the elements include the perpetrator entering into a dwelling house for the purpose of committing a theft or a felony. Um, it is explicitly listed in current burglary law that there's no distinction between occupied, unoccupied, or vacant houses under uh, burglary first degree. Uh, this bill would create a uh, distinction. Home invasion in the first degree or home invasion in the second degree would only be for occupied dwelling houses. Uh, additionally, Mr. Chairman, uh, this bill would uh, deal with perpetrators entering with a weapon and for the purpose of committing a violent offense. Home invasion first degree would be entering for the purpose of committing a forcible felony, a uh, violent felony offense. Burglary, excuse me, home invasion in the second degree would be entering for the purpose of committing a forcible misdemeanor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in addition to, well, well, first of all, uh, this, this bill and this law would help to isolate the most severe offenses and allow adequate and appropriate sentences and parole considerations to be in place uh, when we have the most uh, most serious, I'd submit, um, uh, instances of perpetrators coming into an occupied home with a weapon to commit um, a violent offense. Uh, that um, I think that isolation is very consistent with the uh, work that the General Assembly's done in regard to criminal justice reform to ensure that the most harsh uh, offenses are properly uh, punished. And as we'll have an opportunity to discuss, uh, the uh, inclusion of a mandatory minimum sentence in this, I would note that the Criminal Justice Reform Committee has allowed mandatory minimums to continue to exist on the books. Um, and uh, those are only for the most severe cases. Um, also, I'm authorized to tell the committee here today or provide a proffer from a witness that uh, was here and uh, had to go to another committee hearing, but the district attorney of Gwinnett County, Danny Porter, was present and is available to testify when necessary. He actually served on the um, Criminal Justice Reform Commission, Mr. Chairman, and he uh, would be uh, prepared to uh, testify to his support uh, for this bill and that mandatory minimums are not contrary to the work uh, that the Commission put forth. Um, fi finally, Mr. Chairman, I make the point to the committee that under current law, a person can commit the offense of burglary by entering a, a house for the purpose of stealing just one dollar. There's misdemeanor theft is included under burglary first degree, but there's no inclusion for if somebody enters a, a property a house to commit a violent misdemeanor. That is that is not a felony. That would only be criminal trespass under current law. And I would submit to the members of the committee, if we're going to penalize with a felony anybody that's entering a residence to commit any dollar amount of theft, then there should be a, a, criminal, a felony criminal offense as well to follow with um, entering to commit a violent misdemeanor. Uh, finally, Mr. Chairman, I'll note that I have um, this bill enjoys the support of the Prosecuting Attorney's Council, and uh, I've been able to meet with uh, the representative uh, from Gactel, uh, and, and we've discussed it. And it was after our discussion that I'm submitting this substitute to you today. The uh, bill, as originally written, was favorably reported by the subcommittee, but this this uh, committee substitute, Mr. Chairman takes into consideration um, the possibility that when somebody is uh, charged under, well, it, it creates home invasion second degree effectively and provides the trial court with discretion in determining whether or not mandatory minimum sentences is uh, maybe probated or suspended and uh, would therefore prevent uh, potential extreme situations uh, and we can all think up hypotheticals um, but but effectively would uh, put that into place to allow for the trial court to take those special circumstances into consideration. Uh, finally, I, I would say I'm happy to provide examples, both from my experience um, working as both a prosecutor and a criminal defense attorney, um, from media accounts of why this uh, legislation is needed. Um, but in simplistic forms, I've told many people this is a fault this is following the continuation of we have for motor vehicles we have entering auto is a criminal offense entering to commit a theft 
We have theft by taking motor vehicle if, if the perpetrator takes the, the motor vehicle. And the, uh, the other end of that is hijacking a motor vehicle. That is an offense rather against the, is rather than being a property offense, it's against the individual that's involved and a more severe uh, offense that carries a more severe penalty. Mr. Chairman, the intent of this is to provide that same equivalent for burglary. So we have burglary, which is a property crime, but home invasion first degree or home invasion second degree would be uh, crimes against the occupant uh, of the home. We all know that when a perpetrator enters the house, uh, the, uh, that is, the home is sacred, that that's uh, a, a very uh, traumatizing event, and that um, many times deadly force is, is used to defend the home, of course. Uh, very serious cases. Um, and so, Mr. Chairman, in an attempt to be brief, I would be happy to take any questions. Let me go ahead and get a report from the subcommittee chair, Mr. Pack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the uh, consideration of this bill and subcommittee, the, um, the version of the bill that we passed out actually combined sections B and C as we see here. Um, so it used to be forcible felony or forcible misdemeanor thereof would have been the same crime to address the particular issue that, that uh, Representative Efstration has brought up. Um, it was after that, at the time, we didn't have um, Gactel's, um, uh, any representation or anyone speaking against that. It made sense because this has been a, a loophole, I guess, in the criminal code for a long time. Uh, and we did ask questions about the mandatory minimums and is in line with current law um, and also the, uh, the consecutive nature of any sentences. Uh, and, and the answer was that you needed that to avoid merger of, um, of crimes. And as a result, um, it was, a, I believe, um, there was one vote against uh, um, when we passed this out, the three to one. L let me ask you just to put a little more flesh on that with regard on the penalty provision. The person convic uh, convicted in the first degree or the second degree, 10 to 20, correct? Or, or life was as originally written in that. So, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Mr. Chairman, this uh, this tracks. So where's the distinction between the, is there a distinction? There yes, is sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, the second sentence, uh, so this would be lines 29 to 31, would allow, it's, it says may be suspended, probated, deferred, uh, or withheld. And that's the distinction between first degree and right. second degree. Sorry. Ms. Kendrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this goes back to the issue that I raised in subcommittee. When you're talking about, uh, like on line 13, it starts out without authority, uh, without authority and with intent, especially since we're talking about 10 years as the minimum. Is there a reason that we're using the word intent as opposed to a commission? And why doesn't um, uh, current statutes, why can't you just charge them under like attempted burglary and attempted assault? If, if I could answer your second question first, the, uh, there are cases, and I can, I'm happy to provide you with examples and media reports of uh, perpetrators entering a home to commit, say, an armed robbery, but not actually co committing the offense once in the home. For example, armed robbery has a taking element. So if the person goes in and attempted to, to uh, to commit it, but doesn't complete the crime of armed robbery, then it would not be, uh, then under that circumstance, they could potentially be charged under criminal attempt to commit armed robbery, but that ha that does not carry a mandatory minimum and would have, a, have very different sentencing provisions. And so because of that, uh, as I said, uh, I believe a new criminal offense is necessary to one, isolate the most severe cases, two, provide consistency when it comes to for what purpose the, the person is, is entering under our law, and three, because I, I believe that this is consistent with what we are attempting to do here in Georgia, to be smart about the offenses that uh, are on the books to ensure that uh, the prison sentences reflect the nature of the, of the crime committed. To answer your, your first question, uh, we, we did discuss in, for, first of all, I can just tell you lines 13, 14, without authority, that is taken from the burglary statute, uh, so a person that's not authorized to be there, and with intent to commit, 
Uh, so the burglary statute includes that as well, but as I said, uh, burglary would be a felony or a theft of any dollar amount, the theft. And so um, th this with intent is necessary because, as I said earlier, um, we're not talking about somebody actually committing the crime necessarily once they're in. It's entering with the intent to commit it. And secondly, uh, it's, it's important because we wouldn't want somebody that's just maybe trespassing with a weapon in, in their position to be automatically charged under this. They would have to be the, pros the prosecutor would have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the person entered the home for the purpose of committing one of these forcible offenses. Sorry, uh, Mr. Setzler. As, uh, right, and uh, as um, envisioned and, and seen in, in jurisprudence right now, of course, there's specific intent versus general intent crimes. There would not, uh, there is no included element here that the person knowingly enters, knowing that somebody is home. So the uh, element of occupied, uh, there would be no requirement for the prosecutor to prove that the defendant was aware that somebody was at, at the house at the time of entry under this bill. That's my inter interpretation and, and intent. Likewise, they entered the house and they thought it was occupied. Since they said they were going in to commit a violent crime on someone else and that they ended up not being home. Could this still be prosecuted? No, sir. So, so it narrows it down from that, but if someone breaks in and they didn't think someone was home, that's not a defense. That's correct. Yes, sir. What's your intention with respect to... A and if they intended to commit a, a violent offense once they entered. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got text from my girlfriend. I told her I was going there. They, I, I, this is a wealthy home, $4,000 house. It's a big house in my neighborhood. I'm just going to steal the TV set and scrap it inside the glass. All that stuff can be demonstrated. It's clear intent. Carried a firearm. Uh, but I, I, I need to kind of hear that and package that because um, leading us right into the sentencing No, it's life or in the alternative 10 years to 20 years, uh, which is consistent with um, uh, offenses of armed robbery, kidnapping, um, incest in Georgia's uh, 10 to 20 offense. Um, there are multiple other offenses I could name, name to you that uh, have these sentence provisions. Um, of course, armed robbery is actually a capital offense on the books, but... Um, but this, I'm not requesting that here. So, I read this to be in the way that you tried to read the words and the way that you talked about But I read this to be um, one invasion of first degree leads to life, one invasion of second degree leads to no, no, sir. Um, as, as written and uh, as intended and consistent with um, uh, other similar statutes, it's life or in the alternative, 10 years um, to 20 years. In, in confinement but and and that is for first degree or or second degree but as I said before uh, the the distinction is that home invasion first degree there would be no no discretion it's a mandatory minimum sentence home home invasion second degree uh, there would be discretion um, uh, by the trial court as to issues of suspended probated deferred or withheld and of course I, I don't mean to put um, words in the mouth of the GAC representative, she can 
Ms. Michaels can speak to this. Of, uh, that I believe there's opposition to the mandatory minimum as part of this, but otherwise there's agreement as the language is now tailored following the subcommittee. So. Ms. Dickerson, then Mr. Atwood. Uh, I guess my question was on the mandatory sentencing too. I thought it was a little stiff and, you know, in light of the criminal justice reform that we are trying to, uh, or we have created in Georgia at this time, uh, you don't see changing that at all. Well, the uh, that was that was done intentionally with the hope that burglary could sentences for burglary could be reduced or paroled earlier. People serving burglary sentences. Uh, again, this is in an attempt consistent with criminal justice reform to have the most severe cases identified and punished accordingly. Um, I would also note that mandatory minimums main, were maintained throughout the criminal justice reform that's taken place and um, and as I said my, my um, wit the witness that I expected to to be here and and maybe back in just a little bit would I expect he would testify similar to as he did at the subcommittee hearing that that is not mandatory minimums are not inconsistent with the criminal justice reform package that was presented and passed okay on home invasions on this type of crime in general okay in general yes okay so I would suspect that if someone came to my house and invaded me and you know I was home then if they were caught at that time that their sentence and they go to court would be at least 10 years with intent to harm first, yes, first, degree. Okay, first degree first degree first degree first yes degree. that would okay. be all right so if first they, degree only if they entered with the intent to commit a felon a forcible felony a violent felony yes I understand. and they were armed at the time and you were home yes okay mm -hmm. mr. Allen Representative, I hadn't had a chance to work with you very much, but like you, I come from a defense and prosecution and judge and law enforcement background, so I'm, uh, I bring your attention to lines 18 through 22, and I'm, I'm just trying, I wasn't at the subcommittee hearing. Um, is forcible, a forcible misdemeanor, would that include battery? Yes, sir. Okay, so um, if a person came in without authority or down to line 20 remains within the dwelling house of another I assume a person could be invited in and then refuse to leave yes sir uh, and he's got a gun or a pocket knife on him and gets in a fight with the guy then we're looking at life second degree it's yes second sir. degree which yes, would be 20 years is that what I'm looking at it's 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 the, just just to be completely clear the punishment stays the same the, the difference is yes sir the difference is that the trial court would have discretion to suspend probate or defer so the uh, sentence range would be 10 to 20 or life but it could be probated okay. could be 10 years probation I, I don't have any issues with breaking in coming in forcing you know a gang coming in the problem I have is uh, any other weapon and the issue of a person there and getting into a, a fight with somebody and he's facing life. I mean, that, that concerns me a little bit, but not, let me let me wrap my brain around it here and I'll think a little bit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. May, may I address that just briefly, just just very briefly? Because I was uh, going to follow up on the any other weapon as well. Yes, sir, and and that was just what I was about to discuss. That's that is a problem. We don't have them def defined here either. I don't have yes, it in sir. front of me, and I realize that. So. And and that was made intent. That is intentionally broad here, consistent with again other statutes that okay. uh, weapons. It's it's difficult to contemplate what potentially could be used as a weapon. There was a recent case I saw in the media, in, I believe, DeKalb County, where a shovel was used. The home invader had a shovel. Uh, there to, to use as a weapon and so it is intentionally left broad uh, as um, armed robbery and aggravated assault are really the uh, statutes that mm -hmm. that I have in mind as as um, uh, as I work with legislative counsel on that to provide um, options for a prosecutor um, in in those circumstances I will note though it is it is written as a weapon and um, there was the potential to write an object, device, instrumentality, as is under uh, aggravated assault, and uh, that might be might be very, very loose language, and so uh, that wasn't used. We uh, remained with weapon. What, 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 I'm sorry, go ahead, Mr. Chairman. I follow up. No, please, please. Um, 
was any thought given to, and, and the best way I can describe it, to uh, crafting legislation that dealt with what I, what we used to call in my generation the bums rush. You're, you're rushing in, you're kicking the door down, you're coming through, you're forcing your way through uh, what I think of of a typical home invasion. That we had a lot of these when I was an agent down in Miami that, that was going on. And did was that discussed any uh, drawing it a little bit narrower maybe or no, sir? And I I was drawing on what other states uh, oh, yeah. have in place okay. for similar home invasion statutes that do revolve around coming in armed. Right. Um, of course, breaking is not technically an element no. of of no. burglary, which is different from common law. But the um, but uh, so and and I'm not sure if that's what you would be recommending or. Or if um, uh, so, to answer your question, no, that wasn't really uh, considered. Um, I can speak from my experience in prosecuting cases where um, people that are kicking down the door are typically armed uh, mm -hmm. to go in to uh, rob the occupants of the home or to um, uh, to commit other. Felonies. We had a lot of that in the drug cases that we're doing. There's a lot of home invasions in that area. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. let me just get a little a little more. Um, a little more clarity on the on the weapon piece. I mean, if someone's coming in, uh, and of course we have to think of the absurd examples. If they were coming in and um, they're, you know, swinging fists and so forth. I mean, that I guess that initially that simple assault and battery, simple battery. At some point, it becomes aggravated. If they're walking in with a pocket knife, I mean, that's. Um, that's a weapon. It's not necessarily a weapon they're going to use, the, but it's a weapon. Yes, sir. But it's not something that they would go ahead and use as part of an aggravated assault, or maybe it is. Can you walk? just walk us through that? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, I, I would ask the committee to consider the a perpetrator entering the home armed in any way, whether or not the perpetrator intends to use that weapon, is, puts everybody in peril when that takes place because the homeowner is then in a position to assess or, or determine what's taking place and uh, similar to this is very similar to I would give the example uh, in Georgia a person can commit the offense of battery a misdemeanor but if a person threatens to commit a battery and there's corroborating evidence that's a terroristic threat a felony so in other words the commission of the offense has a less severe penalty than just threatening to do the offense. And that's because I believe the General Assembly didn't, we don't know what might take place. We don't know how, how bad that harm would be if the person actually followed through with the threat. And so if you'd follow my analogy, we don't know how bad things could be once the person enters the house with, with a weapon. And it's because of that it, is a, it would be a felony and a very serious felony to simply enter the, to the home with a weapon um, without an element that the perpetrator intended to use the weapon. Mr. Hightower. I'm, if, if I may represent, if I could just explain maybe what I had in mind at the time and, and um, see if this is consistent with uh, the committee's feelings. Uh, I, I am just mindful of a case that I 
read the media reports about from Cobb County mm-hmm. where a a I think a ex husband was w- remained in the house waiting for the victim to get home, and then committed the murder. And um, my my concern is is if somebody under whatever circumstances were to be allowed into the home but then re- remains there or hides there until the victim returns that the uh, offense would only would be uh, could be charged under those circumstances because maybe entry was made under with with authority but remaining on in, in the house was not authorized and um, and so um, and, and then, and then maybe as a, a secondary argument, just to make um, the the entering or remaining again tracks burglary, the burglary language. But it is not. Uh, I I believe that the bill is very important, and if that is the the only holdup remaining, then then I would would be willing to to uh, certainly discuss with you and the committee about about that amendment. Likely be charged. Yes. Well, except. Y- yes, sir. I understand, and um, and maybe, actually, I correct what I said. The person couldn't be charged under this for for entering because nobody was home at the time when he entered and by remaining there until the victim came home for the purpose of uh, committing the offense uh, that that would be a concern I, I don't want to provide too many examples but I I have personal experience trying cases where uh, where defendants have remained in the home waiting for the victims to come home and then to commit a robbery and in a murder case I tried in 2011 that, those were the exact circumstances so, in in fact, where the defendant had previously uh, kicked down his uh, kicked down the door of uh, someone in a in a drug related case in an attempt to rob them, didn't didn't commit the robbery, and uh, received a sentence of two years. And so, this is this is uh, very much on my on my mind because of uh, those two cases. So. Ms. Randall. I'm just really trying to uh, distinguish the difference. Real, real story. I had a friend went to visit relatives out of state, and um, apparently her nephew's friends had decided to case the place. Well, they didn't know this aunt who wasn't driving either one of the cars was in the house, and they knew exactly when everybody else was going to be gone. They knew which cars would be gone, and and so they totally thought no one was in the house well she was there she was visiting and they didn't have any weapons but it got to be bad and she had to be hospitalized it it got to be a bad situation because she startled them for the most part so in a situation like that tell me tell me what would be the difference in how that person would be prosecuted now and how that person would be prosecuted under under your legislation Um, if the uh, and again I don't know all the details of the facts but if a person broke into the house for the purpose of committing a theft, Mm -hmm. they could be charged under existing burglary statute. However, if they uh, entered for the purpose of, um, so so I guess that would answer your question. It would be, it would be under burglary currently. Um, Certainly any, any violent offense taken toward the victim when she arrived would likely be a misdemeanor unless there was a, oh, an object used um, and, and aggravated assault could be charged. Um, the so I, I hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so that w- so there there wouldn't be a difference between how a situation like that is a situa- a person in that situation would be charged now or if if you're oh, no, no, I'm sorry. This bill would would address um, would address people entering to commit a violent offense. So under your circumstance, under your case, the people had entered to to commit a theft. 
And so if a prosecutor wanted to charge either of these, there would have to be a showing that the person, that the perpetrator entered to commit a violent offense. I'm not saying it's not possible, but, right. that, but that might be more of a stretch to say they were there for the purpose of harming anybody that might, that might come home. Um, it's, it sounds more to me like that would be a, a burglary offense, even if this was, this was an act. Thank you. Mr. Setzler, and then Mr. Atwood. If, if I understand your question, uh, the determination of what the perpetrator's intent was is determined by the manifestations of that intent. So certainly if the person commits a violent offense when they come in, okay, we, we can argue that, that, that there was that intent. Or if co-defendants, you know, there, there are other circumstances where a, yes. Let's say uh -huh. someone's breaking around. They break into a house. Um, they whether or not they knew someone's home doesn't matter. They break into a house, um, they see the homeowner there, and as soon as they see the homeowner, they turn around and break out and leave the wrong way. That, that, that's probably a fairly common circumstance. These crimes go. But there's no ability to demonstrate what their intent was in going in. Now, is the fact that they broke into the house, does that in itself represent the, 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 the intent to commit a crime? No, no sir. I, I, would, I would submit that in those circumstances, there was clearly no intent to commit a forcible offense, and therefore this this crime could not be charged. What would, what would like if they actually entered, it would be burglary. Which is a felony, one to ten. One one to twenty for a first offense. The um the the other option would be criminal trespass, which would be a misdemeanor up to twelve months. Because there again, the prosecutor would have to demonstrate that the person entered for the for the purpose of committing a theft. For, for burglary? For burglary, yes, sir. So what we're really doing is we're really consuming burglary in a lot of these things. What, what I, if, if, yes, if someone's home, like, I guess if no one's home, then you're, you're, you're in the burglary world, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So if someone's home, you've got the weapon, you break in, and you've got the intent, then it's, it's this. If no one's home, then it's, it's burglary. Again. Yes, sir. So really, this, this the, the 10 to 20 really is predicated on whether someone's home or not. And that, that's really the way this is going to operate. And, and a weapon, uh, because a weapon is not an element of burglary, being armed at the time. Okay, so with a weapon and someone's home, then you're in the best, otherwise it's burglary. Um, um, and, and also with the intent to commit a violent offense. That is not an element of, bur burglary includes any felony or any theft uh, with, with the intent. Yes, sir. So, so there's no demonstrated intent. There's no weapon, and there's no one home. That's probably the criminal trespass. It, it it sounds like that. Yes, and and what this would allow us to avoid, I, I would submit, is a repeat uh, offender maybe breaking into a foreclosed on house. I can, I guess this is an example in the other direction to to steal copper or something like that, and being charged as a as a burglar. Uh, under a burglary first degree because it's it's a dwelling house and being subjected to the most harsh parole guidelines for a property offense. Mr. Atwood, could I ask you to hold your question? Would that be all right? I, I appreciate it. We're, I think what I'm going to do is, and let me ask you a due diligence question. You've obviously vetted the vision on the sentencing in the context 
the redefinition of burglary to the various degrees and the various sentencing schemes that we did in the last year or two, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Let, let me ask you, and in, with respect to Mr. Hightower's uh, concern on the remains issue, um, which I don't think is a fatal one. I think it's just one that we need to work through. Let's go ahead and hold the bill until the next meeting, which will be Monday, much in the same way that we're holding Ado, uh, Representative Lindsay's bill, that getting a little more definition on the on the issues that he has, um, really from a due diligence standpoint. I think that'll also give you the opportunity to to visit with members on the committee who may have you know one isolated or more you know issues on it, not in the not in the uh, uh, with no intent to go ahead and stop the bill, but just to make sure that we've got it refined and that we've addressed, you know, individual concerns of, of members of the committee. Is that yes, fair sir. enough? I also wanted to make sure that before we dismissed, I want to make sure we hear from Ms. Michaels to get her. I see you signed up, uh, Ms. Michaels. If you're under no duty to get to testify. I just want to make sure that's clear. Just, just to be clear, and as the, as the mule who carried that, who's carried that water the last three years, um, there, it's not a policy against mandatory minimums. It's more of a, uh, a selectivity on where certain man, ma mandatory minimums will exist and where they won't exist. So, just, just so we're clear. <laughs> For the record, <laughs> and I'm not going to bray or anything right now. <laughs> <So> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Maybe in March. We'll see. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. We appreciate you providing that. Thank you. With that, we'll stand adjourned and um, count on a meeting notice for Monday, probably at the same time, 1 o'clock, unless we go in late on Monday, which I'm not aware of at this point, and in which case, if that, that is the case, then we'll adjust the time. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Restoration. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your hard work. Thank you.